New Mexico's premier annual sports event begins its second decade as the can't-miss event of the holiday season. The Gildan New Mexico Bowl is great times, lasting memories, and unforgettable moments. It's your bowl game. Once again, Major College Football's postseason begins in Albuquerque with the 11th annual Gildan New Mexico Bowl, Saturday, December 17th at high noon in University Stadium. Don't miss out on the excitement. Make sure you're there. Get tickets at the UNM box office. Call 925-5626 or visit GildanNewMexicoBowl.com. We want to fill New Mexico's strength conditioning knowledge gap. The athletes playground was the most overall intense sports specific training that we had seen. We specialize in youth performance training. Everything from acceleration, deceleration, change of direction, speed, agility, quickness, strength and power. All the fundamentals that will actually make a great athlete. The athletes playground had more qualified trainers than where we had gone previously. We use our summer camps mainly as like our off-season training, educating them on why the benefits of what they're doing. We develop tomorrow's superstars today. Folks, there's no other way but to be all in. Either he's Lord of all or he is not Lord at all. And you can experience the real and authentic, true life change that only God can provide to humanity. See, when we truly encounter Jesus and purpose to know him and follow his teachings, hashtag life change will occur. Don't sacrifice quality or flavor when you're in a hurry. Golden Pride delivers the best tasting barbecue chicken and ribs with the fastest drive through in the whole city. Plus, Albuquerque Magazine is awarded Golden Pride for having the best tasting breakfast burrito in town. For a great meal without the wait, come see us at any one of our four locations or visit us online at goldenprideabq.com. Golden Pride, home of Albuquerque's number one breakfast burrito. And welcome everybody here to another edition of the Sports Desk. I'm your host, Scott Colotti, co-host Ed Nunez, the man on my left. And we have a special guest in studio here today. We're going to talk a lot of sports, a lot of things happening here this weekend. The football playoffs coming up this coming weekend. And he's from the Albuquerque Journal, James Yotis. And first off, James, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Scott. Good to be here. And Ed, want to uh, just talk a little bit about what's been going on with you oh well you know what uh gosh it's been a whirlwind of a season i can't believe it's uh, <laughs> we're at the end you know i've got a playoff game in fort sumner on saturday i've got manzano and Trisco on friday and then in a couple of weeks we jump right into basketball and you know having james on james remembers when i was an official for uh Albuquerque basketball Fish association and it's been five years since i officiated and i can't believe that i was thinking to myself can't believe how fast five years has gone. But I've got to tell you this, when I, when, since I joined ProView, my knees do not miss that at all. Someone else's turn, and I'm having a blast doing what we're doing here. And James, uh, you and I had the pleasure of being out at the Bernalillo Soccer Complex on yeah. Saturday. Uh, long day, weather delays, but it was still a fun day and a lot of good soccer on both the boys and the girls front. Yeah, uh, I think you know we had a few one versus two matchups, which were great. Uh, and we had we had quite a few good championship games. I, I can't think of uh, any of them that really were not competitive, uh, mm -hmm. which is good for all of us. Um, yeah, a little weather, but you know what? It adds to the fun of it. We had such great weather the whole fall. I mean, through September <laughs> and October, right. we had pretty much perfect weather. So you know what? It was nice to see the guys and the girls get out there and, and have to play through the mud a little bit and, mm -hmm. and tear up the turf a little bit. You know, it's kind of nice because I, don't, I miss that with football. I miss right. rain games with football where the jerseys were getting muddy and players were slipping and sliding. <laughs> Everybody's on turf now. Yeah. So it was, it was enjoyable to me to see these players get out there and, and, uh, and get their jerseys a little dirty. It was a lot of fun. And the good news, James, is we'll also run down the soccer show highlights later on in the show, is the fact that the weather and the turf wasn't bad enough to affect any of the games. No, the center of some of these soccer fields were a little bit chewed up, but mm -hmm. that was to be expected given as much rain as we had. Um, uh, earlier in the tournament but you know on the whole I thought those fields played pretty well there was some slipping and sliding and I think mm -hmm. that maybe was in large part due to uh, these kids were just used to playing on the turf uh, as opposed to natural grass and I think we saw some adjustments with the kids and I think maybe next year I wouldn't be surprised to see some kids show up with some longer cleats 
to try and cut down on the sliding. But uh, the pitches there were really immaculate, given how little mm -hmm. rain we've had. I exactly. actually was surprised at uh, how even and how mm -hmm. uh, little brown there was in any of these fields. As a matter of fact, there was, very little, there was very little brown in any of these fields, uh, which I thought was a credit to the people who maintain the complex. Uh, these fields were, were tremendous, and it was, it was aesthetically very enjoyable to watch. Let's close out the regular season in football. We'll look at the schedule from last week and the results as we do every week here on the Sports Desk. Then we'll look ahead. You had Valley over Highland. It was West Mesa, big win over Rio Grande. Atrisco beat Albuquerque to win their district. Cleveland held off Volcano. Rio Rancho, big win over Piedra Vista, a game that was a little bit closer than a lot of people thought it would be. Clovis over La Cueva, 21-18. Your thoughts on that game? Yeah, uh, you know, and La Cueva had the ball late in the game uh, around midfield, and they got stopped on a short fourth down around midfield uh, with a couple of minutes left. Uh, who knows if they made that. Maybe they might have made a push to try and, to try and get a late field goal. They've got a tremendous field goal kicker, uh, Chandler Johnson. So um, I think a strong showing. It's a loss for La Cueva, but you know what? Any Albuquerque coach who's been there, and I've been there, I've covered a few <coughs> times at that stadium over the years. Mm -hmm. It's a very difficult place to play, and I would not say that about very many stadiums in New Mexico. Matter of fact, only two, that one and Artesia's Bulldog Bowl. Clovis is a very tough place to play for visiting teams, especially Albuquerque teams. So that's a good showing. It's not a bad loss at all, uh, and I think La Cueva can take a lot of positives from that. Keep looking at the schedule here as other games last Friday. And there were a lot of good ones. Monzano over Sandia. Los Lunas bounced back with their starters back in the lineup. 69-19 over Valencia. It was Belen shutting out Grants. And how about Roswell over Goddard, 22-14? Yeah, that, was, uh, that win by Roswell against Goddard gave the district championship in that league to Artesia, uh, which was maybe just given what had happened the previous week with Artesia and Goddard and this whole fumble thing with the center swatting at the ball. <laughs> so I think uh, as we look back at that district, Artesia finishes first, Roswell second, Goddard third. And you know what? That seems just to me. And Artesia now gets the number one seed in 5A. And, and Roswell is a very good, very good team. That is, that's a team that's flown very much under the radar. They're a three seed now. Uh, that's a team to watch out. They're on St. Pius's half of the bracket, and that is not a terrible draw for them. Before we get to Saturday, a game that finished on Saturday, Las Cruces over Mayfield. As let's pop that back up on the screen here. Ed, uh, we were getting updates. We both did the Atrisco Albuquerque game on Friday, and that game was called 21 to 14. It was Las Cruces over Mayfield, finishing on Saturday, not at Aggie Memorial Stadium, but at the Field of Dreams. I know, and uh, I think James, you might have wrote the article for that. I think it was 10,000 people at the uh, Field of Dreams on Saturday, and that's unusual that that happens. That that game is always packed. There's always 15 to 20,000 at Memorial Stadium. So having to finish the game, the Lobos almost had to do that with the lightning delay on Saturday. So this is unusual. But Las Cruces, we mentioned this at the seating and selection show on Saturday. They will last one game to Cleveland. They've been on a roll since then. I think they've reeled off eight straight wins. So watch out for Las Cruces. James, you mentioned Roswell on the uh, bracket for five, uh, 5A. I think Las Cruces is a team to watch out for on the, uh, in the bracket for 6A. Yeah, you bet they've got, boy, they've got some tremendous weapons on that team, starting with Peyton Ball, the quarterback. Mm -hmm. uh, they've got two really great receivers, Brandon Baeza, Ivan Molina. Uh, they've got Ryan Beltron coming out of the backfield, who is functional, not a great back, but a very solid back, uh, and gives you presence in both the running game and the passing game. Uh, you know, the real key is it, Mark Lopez, is, this is his first go around in the playoffs. I think that's really the question mark with Las Cruces. This is, this is his baby now after Jim Miller retired. So it'll be interesting to see how Las Cruces responds to him in a playoff environment over the next several weeks. Let's look at the games that were actually on Saturday, and there were a bunch. Del Norte over Espanola Valley, 41-19. to 19. James, I wanted to touch on that because they won on district. Yeah, you know, I, I ran into Bruce Binkley uh, at a game we were both at uh, earlier in the year, and this is before district play got began. He looked at me and says, James, we're going to win our district. Uh, and I, I don't think he was really too concerned about that. But Del Norte's won five games in a row, uh, and they started 0-3-1. Uh, that one game got ended at halftime. Another game they lost completely against the Trisco Heritage, I think, to weather. Uh, but they've, they've run five games. None of them against really great yeah. teams, but they do have some momentum as we go into the playoffs. Avery C is a tremendous back, and he's going to have to be going forward because mm -hmm. they have a, a very tough first-round road game in the playoffs at Al Gordo. But uh, they've got momentum, and momentum counts for a lot. A game you are at, James. We want to go over it. It was Cleveland Volcano Vista. We have highlights of this one, and... It was a 52-34 to 34 victory. 
Yeah, you know, Cleveland scored the first 21 in this game uh, and really had Volcano on the ropes. And uh, Volcano Vista, to, to its credit, really got back in this game. I mean, they cut this deficit from 21 points down to two early in the third quarter. They were right in this game, and they were giving Cleveland all kinds of trouble. Uh, and you know what? I thought Volcano Vista played an extremely spirited game. And I like when they play with this kind of energy uh, and this kind of discipline because sometimes they, they let their energy get to them in negative ways in terms of penalties and whatnot. But uh, I was very impressed with the way Volcano Vista hung in this game. And even though even though they lose this game, I thought it was a positive step for them. Big punt return for a touchdown right. there. Yeah, this, you know, special teams, you know, this time of year, boy, you, you, you can't even put a, a real numerical value on how important they are. Um, and team speed is such a big thing. We see Daniel Johnson here catching a long touchdown pass. Uh, this kid, Keith Ridenauer, their coach said, is pretty much the fastest guy on the team. So you give him a break, and, and he's going to make a play. And then, of course, we have this guy, uh, you know, David Cormier, who has all the speed of any player out there outside of maybe Josh Foley or Jordan Bird, and he's 6'3 and about 2'10. Uh, yeah, look, at this, look at that play. He ducks underneath the tackle. Uh, and look at that speed. Runs I mean, by everybody. Wow. This is when I saw this play, I couldn't believe that he actually made it past five guys at midfield. That says a lot. And, and you know, and I'm doing a big piece on David this week, actually, for the journal. Um, and, you know, David has the Josh Foley speed with the tremendous athleticism right. that we saw from Marcus Williams at Cleveland last mm -hmm. year. And David, I think, might even be more athletic than Marcus, as hard as that is to say. David is a tremendous physical specimen and just, he's a total nightmare. He's, he's uncoverable, if that's even a word. Uh, in any offense. Volcano made it 28 to 26. And by the way, back to Cormier, he's getting better and better. And that's the scary thing about it. You're exactly right. From just going back from week one to week 11 last week, he looks like a much more polished you see him receiver. Uh, and like I said, the thing is, his strength is the thing we don't talk about. He is yeah. big and he is extremely quick. Uh, you know, and he's a member of that Volcano Vista track and field program, which is excellent. But boy, he is, he is tremendously strong. And if you see this kid, uh, you know, during basketball, you know what I'm talking about. He's very mm -hmm. cut and he's extremely physical. So uh, anybody, you know, you're gonna you're gonna see double teams on him, I'm sure, on Friday when they play Maple. And your thoughts? Eric? Explosive as well. I think you made a good point there, James. I saw him stiff arm a couple of tacklers in the game I had earlier. But I think one of the things about them, that team collectively, Chris Streets, David Cormier, uh, Abraham Schaap, Dylan Gassaway. Sometimes I wonder against Volcano Vista, at least in Rio Rancho, I thought I expected a little bit more, you know, that maybe they, you know, against Rio Rancho, I talked to one of the uh, Volcano Vista defensive assistants. He thought that that week off hurt them, you know, that they, that they were ready and they're rolling that week off kind of stopped their momentum. And I don't know if that's true or not, but I, I, I got to say this when I saw them I, with that team speed, you mentioned team speed and they have a lot of it. And sometimes I expect, I guess their defense, the special teams has kind of hurt them. You saw that uh, long punt return. Right. Special teams has been a problem for Volcano Vista almost all year so they're right there ready to knock on that door but against the big boys they haven't been so successful and the interesting thing is volcano and cleveland are now in the same half of the bracket mm -hmm. and if volcano wins its first round game they get cleveland again here in the quarterfinals uh you know i think that would be a very very interesting matchup uh, given what we saw last week let's look at the player of the week now since we're talking about david cormier as he happens to be the player of the week and uh you know, again, James, it's amazing a guy this talented getting better and better. Yeah, his stock is definitely on the rise, and I think we'll we'll see uh, more and more schools start to uh, float toward his way. As a matter of fact, I'm planning to talk to David about that very thing when I go visit with him uh, on Wednesday. Uh, we're going to talk about his college prospects and where where that stands, and and talk about some of his offers and and what he wants to do because right now he's got tremendous upside. He looks. I don't, and I don't mean to project this way out in the distance, but he looks like an NFL wide receiver. He does. You know, wow. He's got that kind of physique. He's 6'3". Uh, he's extremely athletic. He's very quick. Um, you know, he's got some things he can work on, of right. course. But he's, but he's he, developing in front of our eyes, which is, right. is kind of cool. He's still on the way up. So there is mm -hmm. tremendous upside, I think, still with him, first at a Division One level, uh, and then possibly beyond right. that. He's a kid... He's a kid you can easily see getting to the next level. And I know that seems like a stretch. And he may not get there, but uh, I don't think it's a stretch to say that either. We'll take a look at the brackets. We'll take a look at everything else that is football coming up in the next segment. First, the top 10 plays of the week by Dave and Busters. Hey, everyone. Adam Deal here with ProView Networks. Extreme Clean is a proud sponsor. And 
and supporter of Progy Networks and all high school sports athletics. Owner Mike McLean and Extreme Clean specialize in carpet cleaning for apartment, realty, business, and residential clients. With over 20 years' experience, attention to detail and quality customer service matters. For more information, give them a call at 505 221 6440. Extreme Clean. All American Waste Removal of New Mexico provides compactors, roll off containers, dumpsters, waste management, recycle services, and waste removal cleanup for home, construction, and business. We have trash containers varying in sizes from 2 yards to 40 yards. If we don't have the size you need, we'll get it. We're a locally owned and operated waste management company, currently offering waste management and trash services in Rio Rancho, Albuquerque, Bernalillo, Sandoval, and Valencia County areas. With 60 plus years of combined garbage removal and trash pickup experience, work for you. Nothing, it was brilliant. Two wish comes out of the head, and it's two to nothing. Nick Williams, ball was perfect, and two wish finishes. Time period. Play toward the middle, hand it toward the net, and in a goal. The Barley Room, proud sponsor of ProView Networks for over nine years, is pleased to introduce Black Iron Catering. From weddings and family reunions to birthdays and office parties, Black Iron Catering is perfect for any event. Contact Jamie at 505-459-8259 and book your event today. Black Iron Catering, let us bring our kitchen to you. How does car crafters make every car look like it never happened? Well... Complicated. Car crafters, it's like it never happened. And we are back here on the sports desk. I'm Scott Kawadi along with Ed Nunez, James Yotis from the Albuquerque Journal, our guest here today, and we're talking a lot of sports. And now we're gonna look at the brackets in football. And we will start with the 3A bracket and go from there as we'll quickly go through the brackets. Any surprises here in the 3A front? No, not really. I mean, Estancia has been the ruler of this division for a couple of years. Uh, you know, Texaco down there, um, 
could be an interesting semifinal if we get to that. Um, I, I always think the Wolverines have a great football program. Um, but really, this is a stancy as division to win or lose. I think I don't see any teams out there. I, and I, I'll be honest, I don't know a ton about Capitan, the two seed. But uh, I think someone would have to play a tremendous game to, to keep a stancy from winning another title. Let's go to the 4A bracket now. And in 4A, the number one seed is, as we're waiting for the 4A bracket, there it is, Robertson, no surprise, the number one seed. And talking about a team really playing on a roll. Yeah, uh, you know, they're one of the few undefeated teams out there. Uh, Fort Sumner is one, uh, Robertson is one, Rio Rancho is one. Uh, there are very few undefeateds out there. Uh, there's some, but there's some good teams in this bracket. Portales is awfully good. You know, I think a robertson Portales final would be tremendous. Moriarty and Portales are maybe seated to play in the semifinals. And Moriarty just played a really tough game against the Rams a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, a game that Moriarty was leading 13 to nothing and ended up losing 21-13. That could be a rematch game there, uh, although Moriarty would have to travel again. But really, uh, you know, Robertson is, is clearly the team to beat. Uh, one interesting thing, too, West Las Vegas there in the 11-6 game of St. Mike's, they just played on Saturday. Right. And now they're going to turn around and play in Santa Fe again this week. Um, and St. Mike's smacked them pretty good, I think 47-8, to something like that. Uh, you know, often in these rematch games, you'll see a much closer game, although I, I don't necessarily see West advancing even in an upset there. So, you know, everything goes through Robertson. <coughs> and speaking of Robertson, Ed, you and I have talked about them all season long. This team is a juggernaut, and they continue to get stronger and stronger, and the scores indicate that. I think the uh, trends, if you're trending strong towards the end of the season, it always bodes well for you, and you're right. Robertson has played solid football all year long. I think that is kind of an intriguing rematch between West and St. Mike's because St. Mike's might say, you know, the, the team-wise, they might be looking past them. You never know. Right. Um, and, and another interesting team here in this bracket is Hatch, the defending mm -hmm. champion there. Defending champs. As, as a five seed, you know, uh, and that's a team you wouldn't necessarily want to run into before the finals. That's a team that could potentially win a game or two in the postseason and run into Robertson eventually. That would be a team to watch, I think. Let's take a look now at the 5A, speaking of intriguing, as ending up at the top seed, Artesia. It's Roswell, number three, St. Pius, number two, Berlin, number four. We talked about this on the selection show the other day, Ed. St. Pius trending at the right moment, although they had a hiccup against Berlin and they had a close game, and I think ultimately that's going to help them. But Artesia, by way of a couple of teams beating up each other, the number one seed. Now, the other thing, too, is we talked about both Del Norte and Almogordo. Almogordo closed the season with three wins, but they weren't against any winning teams. But you can make the same argument for Del Norte, saying that their district wasn't highly competitive. They won a district that, you know, got Espanola Valley, Los Alamos, Albuquerque Academy, that, that wasn't highly competitive. You can make the argument for both, but they're both trending strong. And Avery C., we mentioned, he's, he ran for 253 yards last week, I believe 180 the week, but he's been, he's been a force. So the Tigers have their hands full with him. Del Norte's got to travel on the road there. But again, you win three games against you know the, the teams that you should beat. But still, momentum is momentum, and you got to you got to go with that. So I, that, that that was my comment on that. You mentioned you know if you look at Goddard and uh, and I think James brought this up and me and Murrug. So you got you might have a rematch of Goddard and Roswell in that second round. Now Artesia has their their sights probably set. They want revenge on Goddard. I'm sure they do. I, that that kind of game there, James, I think is going to have you know it's going to have. <laughs> It's going to uh, for years. They're going to be talking about that game, and you know, Artesia and, and Roswell Goddard right. about the way it was won, mm -hmm. and there's going to be sore feelings, and people that won't be forgotten. But you know that oh, no. there's there a couple of what 40 miles separate those towns anyway. That will never <laughs> be forgotten, and you you right. got to take care of business on Artesia. You mentioned this uh, Saturday, Scott. When they lose a game, um, the whole town swells up like, oh boy, this should never happen. How did it happen? They're talking about right. it this morning right. in any coffee shop. They're not talking <laughs> about the election. They're right. talking about how do we lose that game. So exactly. I think that point that you made is well taken. You it know, really is. Artesia, Artesia Goddard is probably, uh, along with Belen and Los Lunas, who could play in the quarterfinals, obviously. Uh, Goddard and Artesia might be the best 5A rivalry in the state. Uh, I've been watching these two play each other for, you know, 30 years. It's a tremendous rivalry. Uh, and it's too bad they're not on the same half of the bracket. I'm not sure that Goddard can get all the way through this half of the bracket. They might be able to. Uh, you know, St. Pius as a two. I'm interested to see what happens with St. Pius because, frankly, when I watched them play Belen, they were extremely fortunate to win that game, and Belen looked like the better team for most of the game. They they gave away some points early in the game that came back to bite them. Um, yeah, you know, sure Belen, did. Belen played extremely well, and you remember we were talking about Alamo a second ago, uh, Ed. 
Alamo is a team that beat St. Pius, beat them pretty good down right. there uh, earlier in the year. So Alamo does have a couple of good wins on its resume, and they play some good teams. Their losses, they lost all the teams in the Roswell district, Roswell, Goddard, plus Artesia, um, and they had a big loss to Las Lunas as well. So Alamo, all of Alamo's losses are really to high quality teams. Uh, St. Pius is a team I'm interested to see what happens with them going forward. Uh, Roswell, I think, is going to be a very tough matchup for Pius uh, later on if it comes to that. I think even Goddard would be a difficult matchup. Drew Ortiz, of course, is the total X factor here. Mm -hmm. That kid is so special. Even when you game plan them correctly, as Belen did many times, that kid still found a way to make plays, uh, which, which was really frustrating for uh, Coach Hennington down at Belen. They defended him several times perfectly, and he still made a big play. So Drew is probably the, the, the one X player on this whole board, I, and, and that includes Amari Samuels from Los Lunas, who could turn this bracket upside down as we go forward. Interesting. Going forward now, we're going to go to 6A and look at the bracket here quickly before we break down all the divisions. And it's Rio Rancho, followed by Cleveland, Las Cruces, Centennial. Really no surprises. No, I had Centennial slotted four. Uh, I, I know Manzano probably feels slighted, but I think Coach Adcox from Manzano probably knows that that loss he had uh, early in the year, week two, uh, was really the difference between Manzano being a four, maybe even a three, uh, and being a five seed. Manzano's an eight and two team. They had Centennial on the ropes uh, in week two, so Manzano easily could have been a nine and one team. Uh, so I, I think a Manzano Centennial game looks intriguing down the road, and I don't think any of us expect a Trisco to get in Manzano's way uh, this week. But uh, I, I'm okay with all these seeds. I had, as I've said to Adam Deal many times, I had Onyate slotted a little higher than I did Clovis, but I'm okay with the bracket the way it came out. Uh, I, I think there are some good teams. Clovis, Onyate, Volcano, six, seven, eight. I, I think those teams are all very closely matched. Uh, so I, I, think, I think the committee did a pretty good job slotting all these teams. Your thoughts, Ed? No, I think, uh, you know, I think, I think, that, I think you, you can't argue with that. I mean, there's a couple of things. The, the team that I'm keeping an eye on is, uh, is the Cueva. The Cueva is a team of almost. Mm -hmm. We almost beat Cleveland. We almost did this. We almost did that. Here's another chance. You're going on the road against Onyate. Onyate, again, they had those wins restored uh, as a result of those forfeits. They had those wins uh, take, given back. And uh, that's a good thing because they'd have been much lower, maybe not even made the playoffs. But that's a team I'm kind of keeping an eye on is the Bears because, you know, and again, it's, it's over with, but earlier in the year, Coach Back went for it against Cleveland on, you know, fourth down, and they didn't make it, and there's a penalty. He could have had Chandler Johnson kick a field goal. He went for it again. And I don't know that that set the tone because the Quavers played well. They've had a good season. But this is a game here. You know, the, the, if you're the Bears, you're saying, well, we're going to prove to people that we're not almost, we're, we're, we're good enough. Mm -hmm. And I think here's a chance for them to do that. But I think, you know, the other thing, too, is with Cleveland on the other side of that bracket, is Trujillo available? Is Angelo Trujillo going to play or not? I've got to say this. I've watched them since they lost to Rio Rancho. They finally got back on their offensive groove on Friday night when they scored 48 points. Or 52, was it? I'm sorry, 52. And, but before that, I thought they were a little bit out of kilter, a little bit out of sync, almost as if they had a hangover for a couple of weeks when they lost to Rio Rancho. But remember, this is a team that has won 22 of 23. You've got to take them seriously. You really do. And there's the defending 6A champs. But a lot of that has to, you know, what, what, what about the injury factor to Angelo Trujillo? If they have to go with the backup, as uh, James Yoda said, it's going to be an interesting, uh, it, you know, maybe they make it past one, but maybe not to pass the quarter. Yeah, I, I was talking about the Cuevas a second ago. You know, you talked about almost. There was the Cleveland game. They only lost by three to Centennial. Right. Centennial mm -hmm. was up here. They played terrible against Manzano. I think they had... Multiple turnovers. I want to say five or six turnovers in the Manzano game didn't show well there either. So La Cueva might be one of those teams that's really anxious to show itself uh, in a big game situation because in several of the big games that they've had, uh, they've they've just maybe coming up short or not played nearly as well as they could in several situations. So right. uh, I think you're right. That is a team potentially to watch. The unfortunate part of it for both these teams is you know they've got Rio Rancho waiting in the next round, um, which which kind of stinks for both of them, but. It's, it's such a coin flip game to me, but I, I, do, I do agree with Ed. La Cuevas probably feels like they, they still have quite a bit to prove, even as a nine seed. Let's look at some of the schedules now coming up this week, and we start with the six-man championship game, and we're even going to go there this week as a couple of championships going on, and the six-man is the first one, and there you see it, number three, Lordsburg. That's actually the 2A game. That's the game that you'll be doing, Ed. That'll be number three, Lordsburg against Fort Sumner. 
You know what? I um, haven't done much research yet. I've done six-man football. I did, a, I think, a one two years ago. And it's an interesting uh, game. It's different than the regular football game. It's going to be exciting. Fort Sumner, I'm sure, is going to be very excited. That town, I've been there. I used to go to eastern New Mexico for two years. So I've been through Fort Sumner many, many times. So I'm looking forward to that. It's going to be a great game. Yeah, you know, and Fort Sumner's 10-0. Lordsburg really put it to Escalante, the number two seed last week. Uh, really kind of an Escalante, I think, was the defending state champion, and, and they thumped him pretty good. So Lordsburg comes in with some men, momentum, but, uh, you know, Fort Sumner's run the table. They're 10-0, and 0, uh, and it is, and I've been to Fort Sumner before for games. It's, it's, it's a wonderful community, and those kind of things. I don't get a chance to do those anymore, but they really are really enjoyable days to spend when you get a chance to get into these little towns who just rally behind their team, and, and it means everything to these places. And, and I think it'll be a great atmosphere when it goes down there on Saturday. I don't think I, I have no doubt about that. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be a lot of fun. Let's see if we have that six-man game. And there it is, Lake Arthur against San Juan. That should be a good one. Yeah, Lake Arthur is, has been a, a six-man power for quite a few years. Um, it, you know, Lake Arthur's town near Roswell. Uh, they've, been, they've been tremendous in this classification for a long time. Um, I, unfortunately, I don't get a chance to watch any six-man football, um, and and they and I have seen games, six-man games in the past. I haven't seen one in many, many years. But these things are so much fun, um, and I, I I'm sure, as Ed would agree. I mean, there's such a tremendous atmosphere, and it's so wide open. It, it's just a, it's just a style of football that that's really fun to watch, and it's 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 extremely unpredictable too, given the nature of of six-man football. So uh, I I would think Lake Arthur probably is favored in this game. I don't know anything about San Juan. Uh, but I'm sure it'll be a tremendous matchup. I thought you were all boned up on all of it. You know what? It takes me. It takes all my energy just to keep track of the 11-man teams. Right. Let's go uh, down the list here. We're going to go to the 3A playoffs, and there's your four seeds: Estancia, Capitan, Dexter, Eunice. And we'll look at the schedules coming up here. And the first slide, you see number nine against number eight. Crown Point will be the host. These games will be 7 o'clock on Friday, Tularosa against Texaco. And then the next slide coming up, and some of these that you'll see coming up will be different days, but it'll be, as we look at the next slide for 3A, that is slide number 3. There you go. It'll be Friday games, Laguna Acoma against Santa Rosa, Newcomb Raton. Found that picture, James, and looks pretty cool. A lot of... A lot of support for Santa Rosa. Yeah, you know, Santa Rosa is another one of those teams, a little bit like Lake Arthur, uh, like uh, Estancia, a, a ton of support for Santa Rosa. One of the first stories I ever did for the journal was out in Santa Rosa. It's a great community. Uh, and they've been very good in football for a long time. Uh, and this team has been down a little bit. Uh, Santa Rosa is, I think, normally accustomed to being in the mix for a top four. So they're, they're a little bit down, but I know they played pretty well over the second half of the year. So as a six seed, yeah, I would, say, I would consider them one of those dangerous floater teams mm -hmm. in that 3A bracket. Let's go now to 4A and do the same thing. We'll look at the top four seeds, Robertson, Portales, Moriarty, and Cobre. And the schedule is as follows, as we'll look at the schedule coming up. Friday games, you will see Taos against Ruidoso, and then Nimi against Hash Valley. Note the time, 6 o'clock, those games on Friday night. And then moving ahead, the second part of the bracket, and these games will be on Saturday. West Las Vegas against St. Mike's, Shiprock playing host to Silver. Well, you know, again, you just, uh, we just have West Las Vegas, as uh, James mentioned, play St. Mike's. You got a rematch there, and, and Silver and Shiprock, uh, you got the 7 and 10. That should be a good game as well. Let's go now to 5A, and the four seeds in 5A Artesia, St. Pius, Roswell, Boleyn. You know, James, every time uh, I do something with Artesia, I put a slide with the big crowds at Artesia. Ed and I always uh, talk about the support there. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, Bulldog Bowl is one of, the, one of my favorite places to go. Uh, I've been going down there since I was just a kid working at the Journal. Uh, it's, it, there is no atmosphere hmm. anywhere, uh, and I would include Tasker Arena even, wow. uh, for basketball hmm. that rivals what Bulldog Bowl is like, especially in the playoffs. Um, it's just, I mean, 29 state championships. They're going for their 30th state championship. That's, that's really hard. To, that's hard to fathom. Uh, the next, yeah. the next team on the list, I think, has 17. I think it's Lovington, but I'm not sure. Uh, but going for a 30th state title, their third straight uh, in the new 5A division. Um, and you know what? And they're still probably stinging from that Goddard loss, as, as Scott was saying earlier. So 
Uh, this is a team that has a lot to play for. But having said that, I think this bracket is fairly wide open, unlike 6A with Rio Rancho. I think there are several teams in this bracket that, mm -hmm. if they get hot, could win this thing. Uh, that includes Artesia, but Artesia being a one, I wouldn't say they're a slam dunk one the way Rio Rancho is. So there are other teams in this bracket, yeah. even teams that are not on this screen, like Goddard, um, right. like Alamogoro perhaps, who in the right circumstances could beat Artesia. Let's take a look at the game times now for the schedule in 5A. And you see Del Norte, Alamogordo. That's 7 o'clock on Friday at Alamogordo. And Los Lunas playing host to Kirtland Central. That'll be a 5 against 12 matchup. The winner plays Boleyn. Let's go to the lower part of the bracket. And rounding it out, Mia Mura, who started out so hot, they're playing at number 6, Goddard at the Wool Bowl at 7 o'clock. And then Aztec playing host to Farmington. Yeah, you know, I'm thinking about uh, the previous page. We have uh, Los Lunas. Amari Samuels got back into the lineup last week after missing some time. Mm -hmm. So his return, along with quarterback Nick, Nick Garland, Garland yeah. right, makes Los Lunas a comp they're one of those teams, and I should have mentioned them a second ago as well, one of those teams outside the top four who potentially could make some noise. Now, I know Los Lunas has a big loss to Artesia later, and they might meet up later, but uh, assuming Los Lunas takes care of Kirkland, to have Los Lunas and Belen playing each other in the quarterfinals, that is, a, that is great for football in this state. Uh, that would be a tremendous, tremendous ticket to get a hold of because Belen Stadium is very small, not nearly big enough to accommodate the people who are going to want to see this game, uh, which is unfortunate, including me. And I would love to go see it, but I won't even be able to. Uh, like I said, this assumes that Las Lunas takes care of Kirtland, but uh, Las Lunas is another one of those teams that could, that could make a little bit of noise depending on how the bracket falls. By the way, I put the number six seed, the highest seed on that page. Um, last week we had the Goddard Rocket. I was going to use that again because you and I both like that picture, but that was a Goddard celebration shot. Yeah, yeah you know what? When Did you that put for the, you, Ed. <laughs> well, no, yeah, you know what? When you put that rocket up there last week, it brought back a lot of memories just of a lot of different things. So that was a good slide. You always do the best job with that. And now we took a sneak peek. Let's go back to 6A now, and you'll see the top four seeds, and it's Rio Rancho, Cleveland, Las Cruces, Centennial. Looking ahead now at the schedule. Some intriguing games here. The top of the bracket on the schedule. Friday games as we'll look at the top of the bracket here. And there you go. You got a Trisco Manzano and Onyate taking on La Cueva. That is a top of the bracket game, but on Saturday. Right. Uh, probably good for La Cueva to have an extra day uh, to get ready for this game. Uh, boy, that's, that's such a coin flip game, uh, even more so than some 9-8 games. I've seen 9-8 games that were, like Del Norte and Alamogoro does not strike me as a coin flip game. I think Alamogoro rolls in that game, unlike this game, uh, which seems like a complete coin flip. Uh, you know, Nyate's, after that win against Mayfield and they went through forfeiting, then getting those wins back, they finished the year with losses to mm -hmm. both Las Cruces and Centennial. So they do not have momentum as we start. La Cueva just was on the road at Clovis. This is a much easier road trip to make than the one to Leon Williams Stadium in Clovis. The Field of Dreams is a fairly neutral site as, as road venues go. So uh, that would be a fun matchup. Two pretty good defenses in that game. Uh, La Cueva's got this new spread with Rico Marcelli, the former Valley coach, mm -hmm. which has been hit and miss, to be honest with you, during the course of the year. Some days it looks very smooth, other days it does not. Uh, and Onyate has got some, some good playmakers on that side of the ball, but the La Cueva defense, I think, is up for the challenge. Uh, I, I'm still not sure who I'm picking in this game, but it's really a tremendous matchup. Let's look now at the bottom part of this bracket as we close out the segment, and these games will be on Friday. It's El Dorado at Clovis and Mayfield Volcano Vista. Well, that's uh, we mentioned El Dorado. We haven't talked about El Dorado and Clovis now. We mentioned on the selection show, Clovis, Micah Gray has been running the ball very, very well. And I favor Clovis. Now, Eldorado, we mentioned this earlier in the year, Scott, when they graduated Noah, uh, Noah Schweitzer, the linebacker. I felt, you know, they graduated other people. But on defense, I thought his loss was big because he called the signals for the defense. He told people where to be, things like that. And Eldorado's defense has struggled all year long. They really have. Right. And Charlie Dotson, their head coach, said that they would. He said he had a defensive line that was undersized and would have difficult time stopping the run, and then you got a guy like Micah Gray, who along with Josh Foley is having the biggest season of any 6A running back. So this is a tall task. But the, when El Dorado played at Clovis in the regular season, El Dorado had a couple of fumbles, three of them I think, that really hindered their chances. And that game was, was fairly close most of the way. So if, if El Dorado can take care of the ball, 
uh, I think this game can be extremely, extremely close, uh, no matter what Clovis does. Uh, in Maverick 3, the four games in 6A are rematches. You know, El Clovis beat El Dorado down there in the regular season. Manzano spanked Atrisco Heritage in that first game of the right. year. Uh, oh, it should have been a shutout. And then, of course, Volcano Vista roughed up Mayfield uh, when Mayfield was up here in the middle of the year. And now Mayfield gets another crack at them with Isaac Vance, who did not play in the first right. game. And believe right. me, the, and everybody knows this, I'm not saying anything that's a surprise. Having Isaac Vance. He'll make a difference. Yeah. yeah. Uh, is a whole different task <laughs> now for Volcano Vista's defensive staff as they try and game plan against Mayfield. So uh, some really intriguing matchups here, not necessarily Manzano and Trisco, but the other three look to be, uh, could go either way. And we'll break down some of these games here out of the break. You're watching the Sports Desk. Terry Cosper Insurance Agency is a proud partner with ProView Networks and a proud supporter of New Mexico High School Athletics. Terry has been a local farmer's agent for over 20 years for auto, home, life, and business insurance. Just like high school sports are important, so are team drivers. For more information, call Terry or one of his licensed staff members at 898-5556. Quotes are available for you. Dr. George Strip. The Ultimate Sports Chiropractor is a proud sponsor of ProView Sports. For 34 years, he has been the chiropractor for sports injuries, soft tissue, muscle fatigue, muscle sprains, neck and back injuries. Dr. Stribling specializes in a kinesio taping technique that is designed to facilitate the body's natural healing process while providing support and stability to muscles and joints without restricting the body's range of motion. Sports injuries are Dr. Stribling's specialty. Get into the game. Garden Schwartz Team Sales features fine products and apparel from Wilson, Shut Sports, Speedline, and Russell Athletics. We offer custom embroidery and screen printing services for all of your school or club needs, from team uniforms to school letter jackets. Specializing in all sports and serving all communities, from big schools to small schools, from up north to down south, or all points in between, Garden Schwartz Team Sales has the products and professional services you'll need to be your best. For great prices, friendly staff, and quality products, Call Garden Schwartz Team Sales today at 1-800-880-7767. That's 1-800-880-7767. Since 1939, Garden Schwartz Team Sales is a proud supporter of New Mexico Youth Athletics. Don't sacrifice quality or flavor when you're in a hurry. Golden Pride delivers the best tasting barbecue chicken and ribs with the fastest drive through in the whole city. Plus, Albuquerque Magazine is awarded Golden Pride for having the best tasting breakfast burrito in town. For a great meal without the wait, come see us at any one of our four locations or visit us online at goldenprideabq.com. Golden Pride, home of Albuquerque's number one breakfast burrito. Folks, there's no other way but to be all in. Either he's Lord of all or he is not Lord at all. And you can experience the real and authentic, true life change that only God can provide to humanity. See, when we truly encounter Jesus and purpose to know him and follow his teachings, hashtag life change will occur. And welcome back, welcome back here on the Sports Desk. Scott Colletti along with Ed Nunez and James Yotis from the Albuquerque Journal as we are talking a lot of sports. Got a lot to cover here before we go. And we're going to look at some of the games coming up. And we will start off with El Dorado at Clovis. We talked a little bit about this game already, but we will look at it in depth as it should be a good one here El Dorado taking on Clovis and there you go with Matt Dennis solid season so far leading the offense Dominic Sandoval one of the leaders on offense a skill position player deluxe Micah Gray 1404 rushing yards 26 TDs also two receiving TDs and Sebastian Roanhouse 982 passing yards he's back in the flow six touchdowns Four picks, and he had a big game against La Cueva, 234 yards, one touchdown, but three picks. Yeah, you know, 982 passing for a Clovis team is a lot, generally speaking, if you know Eric Roanhouse, his grandfather, Sebastian's grandfather. Uh, this is a lot of throwing for them. 
to me, the key in this game, can Eldorado's running game keep Micah Gray off the field? If Micah Gray is the biggest impact player in this game, which he is, can Eldorado's offense keep him pinned to the sideline as much as possible? So that becomes uh, incumbent upon guys like Dennis, uh, Richard Gallegos, Elias Baker, among others, to, uh, to keep this offense moving, try and limit Gray's touches as much as possible, which is, of course, easier hmm. said than done. Dennis can throw it, and there are weapons in this offense. Gaither, Dominic Anderson among them, uh, Dominic Sandoval. Mm -hmm. uh, so Dennis does have some guys to throw to. His completion percentage is not all that high compared to some other throwers, but Dennis did play in the state championship game last year. He right. did play in the state semifinals last year. He's got playoff experience, which Sebastian Roanhouse does not. So we'll see if that, if that playoff experience for Matt Dennis last year sort of translates into some productivity at Leon Williams on, on Friday. Plus, El Dorado will have the added benefit of having a neutral officiating crew as opposed to a Clovis crew, which they had the first time they played them. There will be a neutral crew coming in from another mm -hmm. location in this game. That is definitely a benefit for El Dorado. I, <laughs> and I'm not knocking Clovis officials. Right. That's not the point. But it's a tough place to win, and we all know, and we all know one of the reasons why. Uh, it, we'll have a neutral crew in this game. So uh, El Dorado's got a lot going for them. Matter, matter of fact, they're going to be my upset pick of the week this week, uh, and that's maybe a stretch, but I still feel like Charlie Dotson uh, in a repeat game, uh, I feel like he'll, he'll figure some things out. And if they can play a clean game, relatively speaking, not turn the ball over like they did the first time, mm -hmm. uh, they, should, they should have a, a more than a fighting chance to win this game. Other games to go over quickly, Mayfield Volcano Vista. And this should be a good one, Isaac Vance. Back in the lineup, he missed a lot of time. He had 114 yards against Las Cruces. I think he's a, he's a big piece. Well, you know what? He was hurt, and I, I remember reading your article in the paper, very tight-lipped about what was ailing him earlier in the year. I remember he was in uh, wore his letter jacket and pants, and he wouldn't even answer questions as to what was ailing him. So he's back, and you mentioned he's going to make a big difference, and I believe that he will. Uh, Volcano Vista had no trouble earlier in the year with uh, Mayfield. Uh, they're, again, the, you talk about trends. They came off a pretty decent effort against Cleveland. But with Vance back in the lineup, but Mayfield, again, is I think they're kind of towards the end of the year have uh, kind of puttered out a little bit. So that game there, I'm going to go with the Hawks. I think they've got enough uh, speed and other things. David Cormier, you mentioned that. I like. I, I, I haven't heard much about Abraham Shaft lately, and I don't get. I don't understand why kids are hurdle champion, one of the fastest kids in the state. And when, when you talk about Chris Streets, they've just got pure speed to stretch that field. And sometimes they, they drive me crazy because they, they don't do enough of it. Chris is probably the most underrated tailback in 6A. I think mm -hmm. doesn't get near enough credit for the type of player he is. Look at those numbers there. Uh, over 1250, 17 scores. He's got explosive speed. You know, he can he can hit the holes. He knows how to read his blocks. Uh, this is a kid that probably doesn't get as much run publicly with people like me uh, that, as he should. Uh, he he is definitely one of those players. If you focus too much on Cormier or Abram Shap, um, you know, Chris is the kind of kid who can go off for a buck fifty, buck seventy five, and I know Volcano would love to keep this Mayfield offense. Uh, off the field as much as possible with Gavin Swinson, the big receiver who's committed to New Mexico State, uh, Vance, who's committed to Kent State, that's a division one player, Tori Lachlan, who's a very good athlete. Uh, this Mayfield offense does have weapons, but you know what? So does Volcano Vista. We've seen that. We've seen that repeatedly this year, including the Cleveland game last week. They had multiple players, including Gasway, the quarterback, mm -hmm. Streets, Cormier, all going off in that game. Yeah, Dylan Gasway, over 2,000 yards, 21 touchdowns, just four picks. So look at the next game. It's Atrisco and Manzano, and a couple of district champions in this one. Atrisco just four and five. They had a game cut out due to weather. Manzano eight and two. Manzano on a six-game winning streak since getting pounded on the road against Rio Rancho. I think outside of Rio Rancho, as a matter of fact, since Manzano lost to Rio Rancho and got destroyed, basically. Um, Manzano's played some of the best football in 6A. Mm -hmm. uh, as a matter of fact, uh, people don't remember this, but Manzano and Rio Rancho were tied 20-20 fairly early in that game. Uh, Manzano had a couple of pick sixes in that game. Uh, this defense is very good. Um, Atrisco had no success against them in the season opener. And I know Atrisco has certainly improved quite a bit from week one to the first week of the playoffs, but boy, it's just difficult to see that offense, which cannot throw the ball really, or does not throw the ball, having a ton of success against them, this Manzano defense. Uh, I, would, I would hope Patrick Johnson will have a couple of new wrinkles to show Manzano from what they were in the season opener because 
Manzano right now looks awfully, awfully strong. And they're upset they have to play this weekend mm-hmm. in the first place because <laughs> I think right. in their heart of hearts, they still felt like they were the fourth best team and should have gotten a first round by. So Manzano's got something to play for, and it's a tough matchup for Atrisco anyway. Even even as well as they run the ball, they're going to have to find some, they're going to have to come up with some special teams plays, maybe a defensive score to keep them in the game. A game that Ed Nunez and I both like. The next one will be La Cueva and Oñate. Yeah, we mentioned that earlier. You know, again, here's a La Cueva's chance. And, uh, you know, you, Kevin Finelli, we, Josh Wojcic has had a very good season. He's done very well for them, runs the ball very well. We haven't heard as much from Kevin Finelli lately. I think one of the points that James made, that spread uh, offense has been, you know, it's been better than what they had last year, though. I'll tell you that. They're very vanilla, Absolutely. very vanilla. Absolutely. So I think uh, Enrico Marcelli has done a very good job there at La Cueva. But, you know, they had a year to put it in. And Chris Campbell, I think, with that spread, his skill level came, you know, you really saw what he can do. And, Chris, and yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Chris Campbell, I think, is maybe the key to this game for La Cueva. They do have receivers, Reese Wilkinson, uh, Tristan Rosewald, right. plus Finelli, right. who, as Ed said, has actually been pretty quiet, I think, over the second half of the year as people sort of latched onto him because mm-hmm. he had a humongous first half. Uh, but there are other weapons in this passing game besides Kevin. Uh, like I said, in particular, Reese and Tristan. Um, you know, Woyson, Woyson's a solid running back. Not great, but he's very solid. Um, you know, LaCueva's going to have to take care of the ball. That's, that's the one thing I've seen with this offense. They can get sloppy with the ball. They can get a little bit erratic in this offense, which is designed to be like Valley's old offense, very quick, running up to the line of scrimmage, like Rio Rancho plays, like Cleveland right. play. Get up to the line of scrimmage, quick snaps, a lot of snaps. Uh, that will have to be very clean against a very veteran Onyate defense. Uh, the thing with Onyate is this is not an offense that will be unusual to them. Uh, they see this with Cruces. They see this with Onyate right. or with Centennial. Right. Rather. Um, but Onyate's defense has, has given up quite a bit of points the last couple of weeks. Yeah, they have. the regular season. Uh, La Cueva, I would not describe as a high-scoring team, um, but boy, there's just so much to love about this game. I, it, you can go either way on this game. There's so much, so much to love. Uh, and Ed probably made the best point earlier in the show about La Cueva having something to prove and wanting to, uh, uh, you know, find a way to put a complete game together, which I'm not sure they have the whole year. A couple more games to go over before we go to break. It's Del Norte, Alamogordo, and that's at Alamogordo. And this one should be a good one. I don't know if you've noticed a trend, James, but the ones that don't have max prep stats, I editorialize a little comment. And the other <laughs> ones that do, we put the stats in. Well, I, I do know that Avery C., <laughs> after, after his game the other day against Espanola Valley, he's about at 1,550 That's yards. why I brought that up, because I knew that you would know his yardage. He's about 1,550 <laughs> for the year. Um, I don't know his touchdown total, but it's, it's over 20, I believe, for the year. He had, I think, 250 and four touchdowns the other day. Uh, this will be... Uh, one of, uh, other than Los Lunas, this is going to be the best team Del Norte's played, I think, this season. Uh, and, it, and it's on the road. Now, Alamogordo actually plays pretty fair at home. Uh, I, I'm one of those people that does not believe in home field advantage <coughs> in high school football, mm-hmm. uh, generally speaking, except for maybe Artesia. Uh, Alamo does tend to play a little bit better at home. Uh, you know, Kyle Hooper there uh, had a tremendous junior year. His numbers, again, very good. Look at that touchdown to interception ratio there, 24 to 6. So. You're talking a four to one touchdown to interception and ratio. 2,600 total yards, basically. Right, uh, and if it wasn't for Drew Ortiz, this kid probably would get a little bit more publicity himself. Um, you know, he's he's a tremendous quarterback. Don't worry, he's going to have their hands full with that kid um, on Friday night. Your thoughts on Del Norte? Well, you know, we've talked about that, and I think one of the things I wanted to mention about Avery C., they lost him last year, I think, I believe, after the second game, and Del Norte was never the same last year. He lost 20 pounds in the offseason, and you could tell it's made a difference because he's a lot lighter on his feet. He's quick. He runs people over. The only thing that stopped him, I mean, Scott and I joked about this, was a broken sprinkler head at the academy. I think you wrote that article. Yeah. Yeah. So that, 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 yeah. That's it. And believe me, I read everything you write. So I think that's the only thing that stopped him the second half of the season. Now, you're right about Al Magordo. Uh, you know, one thing they they started out strong last year, faded, kind of did the same thing this year, although they did close the season with uh, two straight wins. But it is kind of tough uh, for Del Norte to go on the road and beat Del Gordo. But running games travel well. And I, I like the way Avery C is playing right now. So I think the Knights do have a chance. Yeah, I, I'm not sure I buy into that because I think Alamo is going to go hard after C, who actually lost 50 pounds, he told me. Oh, wow. 20, yeah. uh, from mm-hmm. last year to this year because of that ACL to his knee. Uh, I think Alamo's going to, they're going to stack the box. They're going to go after Avery C. And why wouldn't they? And they're going to force other players like Devontae Garcia to find ways to beat them. Uh, Del Norte is not top heavy with skill position kids. 
my concern for Del Norte is if Avery C is neutralized or has a, you know a modest game rather than a huge game, what other athletes are going to step right. up for Del Norte on the road and give them big plays and give them points in the red zone? Yeah. That concerns me. I'm not sure they have that depth at the skill position to to do that. But you never know. Avery is a special kid. Um, he's one of those kids, and even though he's dropped 50 pounds, he's still extremely physical. But now he's quick. He's about 205, 210 now. So if he has a big game, sure, I think Del Norte has a chance. But I, I don't know that Alamo will allow that. Let's look quickly at the next two games. Kirtland Central, they're on the road against Los Lunas. And Los Lunas, 7-3, and three, and they've got their... Weapons back, Samuels and Garland. You see the numbers there. But Kirtland Central, they have a couple of good guys that have big numbers as well. So could be an interesting game here. And then the last one, West Las Vegas and St. Mike's. A couple of teams that we really don't get the key on. You see the numbers there for West Las Vegas. They have very good ones. But this is a tough one for them going back to St. Mike's. Yeah, Xavier V. Hill from St. Mike's, definitely one of the better athletes in the 4A classification, and I mean overall athletes, mm. not just football athletes. Uh, boy, you know, you'd like to think West Las Vegas could keep this closer. I saw them play uh, academy here uh, during the year. They were they actually had good size, uh, a couple of good skill position kids, and I'm sure they will keep this game much closer than the regular season game. But at home, you have to like St. Mike's to advance here. Switching ahead now, let's quickly look at some of the highlights of the soccer as we'll key on a couple of games. We'll look at the 1-4-A game and uh, we'll take a look at the highlights here. And it was a close game here as it was Sandia Prep and Hope Christian. Yeah, you know, I saw these two teams play each other in the finals of the academy tournament when Prep beat them. Uh, you know, and Prep had only given up just, I think, six goals the whole year before this championship game, and then Hope comes out and, and gets the first two on them. Uh, so it was nice to see the best team in the classification, Sandy Prep, have to summon a really great performance to come from behind against their biggest rival. Uh, so very well done to Sandy Prep and Gina Cormier, their head coach. Uh, they were one of the best teams in the state, regardless of class, the whole year. So here you see the big game winning goal there and it was Sandia Prep with the win. Let's now go to the 5A girls soccer and in 5A you had Academy with the only goal over St. Pius. Yeah, Eliza Mariner was their top player really the whole year so uh, the fact that she got the game winner is probably uh, a just thing. Um, you know, it was a tough way for St. Pius to lose. They were the number one team the whole year and they were looking for their fourth straight title. Uh, you know, Peter Glidden, the new academy coach, he'd been coaching in South Africa, came back up to his alma mater, uh, and here it is, his first season, and they have a state title. Let's go to the 6A girls quickly as we roll through these as quickly as we can. And in 6A, you had a one nothing game, Cibola over La Cueva. This was very entertaining, and it took a good goal to get the victory. Yeah, I always could see my alma mater win a state title. Uh, they had a lot of girls back from last year's team that won state as well, Jazz, including Jasmine Marwin, who had the game winner. Let's take a look now at the 6A Boys Championship. And uh, actually, that's the 1 4 It will stay here, Santa Fe Prep over Bosque, as we're trying to get through these as quickly as we can before the this show right, ends. Yeah, this right here was one of the prettiest goals I saw the whole weekend. And that is a defender who scored his first goal of the year. That was unbelievable skill there. Let's look now at the 5A, and there you see it was Academy with a victory over St. Pius. There's Charles Touche, who, who just had a tremendous season for Academy. Uh, boy, I mean, he had, I think, close to 40 goals. and That kid was just amazing. He was the best player in the state this year. So this was a victory for Academy. And, you know, what, what a season they had. They were number one pretty much from the get-go. Yeah, you know, they play a very rigorous schedule against a lot of the top 6A schools here in the Albuquerque metro area. Uh, and they had some losses, but that's a tremendous finish. And there's a 6A title game, La Cueva over Albuquerque. And a couple of good goals here. They had the band for Albuquerque there. It sounded like a World Cup game, James. Yeah, Albuquerque High has great soccer fans. They really are maybe the best soccer fans of any 6A school. Uh, you know, La Cueva wins it with Coach Easy Jimenez, who becomes the third different La Cueva coach to win a Boys State title. We saw that first goal by Chris Manning, which was one of the great goals of the tournament uh, that really ended up being the game winner. And there you see the final score there as we 
seemingly made it through all of our slides and all of our highlights here as we're wrapping up the show. Guys, final thoughts in 30 seconds. Uh, just excited for the football playoffs to get here. I got state volleyball this week, but I'm ready for football. Yeah, me too. I think football playoffs, the brackets we looked at, some of the matchups, very exciting. Should be a good week. Should be a fun week. I'd like to thank James Yonis, Alden Iwani, and David Davis, our directors. For Ed Nunez, I'm Scott Cloddy. We'll see you next week on the Sports Desk.